Try to imagine yourself in the South Arlington Island at an Orthodox Jewish synagogue. It is very hot and stifling in the upstairs balcony where the women and girls have to sit, looking down at the men and boys who are chanting and reading the Torah in Hebrew. It's just not fair, I repeat to my mother. I'm the best student in the Hebrew school and I can't keep up next week. All I get to do is to go into the rabbi's study and read Hebrew to him. And I can't sit downstairs and read and pray in Hebrew. All because this is an orthodox temple, and mostly all because I'm a girl. You're absolutely right, Paula, answers my mother. It's not fair. But then, life's not fair. I had just turned 13. I certainly didn't know the terms global justice, gender justice, feminism. But I did know that there was something inherently wrong with this separation, with this inequality. It could have been just about any place, in any house of worship, in a courtroom, in a political arena, that doesn't matter. I'm here to talk to you this morning, Bill, um, about narratives and global gender justice, so I started with my own story. Sometimes students ask me why I've become so involved in teaching and writing about issues of global violence, gender, and human rights especially when I have been trained in French and Quebec literature and culture. And I did have a very happy and supportive family in childhood. But then I think about my early intuitive statement of it's just not fair. I think about my deep desire to study, to teach, and instill in others an awareness of these issues of global social and gender justice. I guess that in some way, it's my own form of activism to answer my mother's statement of life's not fair but also to follow through on her encouragement of tolerance, respect, understanding, and appreciation of diversity, and to do whatever I wanted to do as my father deeply believed I could. It's my way of encouraging my students to question, to learn, and to act. And it all comes together in the stories that people tell about their lives, stories in novels, short stories, poetry, memoirs, theater, film, photography, painting, all the arts. My topic today is one that bombards us all daily, especially in the Western media. Just look at the covers of certain mainstream magazines. Time Magazine, for example, in 2010, of an Afghani woman <coughs> whose nose and ears have been, whose nose and ears have been cut off by her Taliban husband. Read the column from Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times. Watch the Academy Awards to learn that the short documentary, Saving Face, about acid burning in Pakistan won, the, won an Oscar. Follow the viral success and controversy of the YouTube video from Invisible Children, Coney 2012 and its sequel, about Joseph Coney's Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda and now in South Sudan, Central African Republic, and Congo. Watch the recent film about Bosnia, which I just finished watching last night, um, written and directed by Angelina Jolie in the land of blood and honey. Read about the activism and financial commitment of the likes of Jolie, Brad Pitt, George Clooney, Bono, and other celebrities, and their concerns over such faraway places as Darfur, Burma, and Zimbabwe. And what you get is what some people have labeled as human rights chic, a worldwide secular religion, the lingua franca of global modern moral law. Rather annoying terms, I think, since they detract from the importance of awareness and activism, and especially the importance, whoops, the importance of a storytelling in getting a wide spectrum of people to learn about the horror of human rights violations. What I'd like to do next is to show you very briefly a series of images, starting with that Time Magazine cover, that illustrates some of the human rights abuses that specifically target women and girls as I read aloud three short quotations about violence, gender, and narrative. I do warn you that some of these images are quite graphic. Quote, violence against women is perhaps the most shameful human rights violation, and it is perhaps the most pervasive. It knows no boundaries of geography, culture, or wealth. As long as it continues, we cannot claim to be making real progress toward equality, development, and peace. And that's from Kofi Annan, former US Secretary General. Quote, international human rights law can only claim universal application 
If it reflects and takes into account the experiences and concerns of all persons, not just the experiences of those privileged by the system. Identifying particular classes of persons for special attention is not antithetical to the principle of universality. It is the cornerstone of human rights protection in Alice Edwards' Violence Against Women and the Human Rights Law. Quote, stories bring to society its identity, but they cannot be just any story. They must respond to a shared reality which society itself fashions out of its myriad events rooted in time and place, and yet fluid and ever-changing. They can't be fictional inventions in the sense of forgeries or misrepresentations. They need to be inventive fictions in the sense of discovering historical social truths that can be granted reality in narrative words. They must, in a deeply rooted literary sense, ring true. And that is from Alberto Mangual's The City of Words. And do not panic, I'm not starting over at the beginning. This is the holding um, soldier's love. The intellectual puzzle that I've been studying now and researching for several years is how to insert gender and specifically the representation of the female body into discussions of narrative text in the human rights discourse. Human rights violations affect people in many ways, physically, psychologically, socially, economically, but one of the central concerns regarding such abuses is the physical territory of political, social, economic, and religious struggles over what constitutes women's human rights over their own bodies, when there remains a very widespread belief in the devalued and subordinated stat status of women and girls. When we read, listen to, or see stories about such human rights violations, we often confront the danger that because of the aesthetic form of a violent text, we can be seduced into seeing only textual violence while failing to see any connection to the real world or any personal complicity with the violence enacted in the text. This is thought of, for some people, not everybody, because it's only entertainment type of, um, type of reaction. An additional problem can arise when these representations, uh, with these representations, because they can and do change over time, according to who is looking, at whom, when, and where. Representations for others are too often interpreted merely as a reflection of reality, and people fail to ask who's holding the mirror, for whose benefit, from what angle, or as Bethany Sharfstein has cleverly said, I think, we should ask of the work of art not what is that, but who is that. But as a professor and researcher of women and gender studies, I also believe that even if we read fiction alongside of reality, it's not possible to speak of violence without discussing the body or understand any representation of violence without referring to its gendered nature. And if that gendered story were to be narrated or filmed or performed or sculpted by a woman, by a woman who speaks in fragmented phrases, remembers in a non-linear fashion, focuses on the blank spaces and silence, and shapes up syntax in order to find her voice and make it known, that female voice has the potential to demonstrate visibility, strength, resistance, and survival. But here we come to a central concern of mine. If we separately categorize women, female bodies, we run the risk of demarginalizing their rights as uh, minority rights, special interest group rights. In other words, can we, should we, and if so, why and how do we separate women's bodies from the violation and cruelty done to all bodies, since men's, boys, trans, intersex bodies are tortured and violated too? We can certainly move from the particular, the local, the individual, to the universal, since those who study human rights say that they, some, in some sense, play at the intersections of the particular and the universal. But we all embody human rights in different ways and claim human rights in our own special ways. Women's texts are often, however, seen as negotiating between the obvious I of identity and the creative we of feminist communal identity. Is it possible that this is more true for women in the female body? Of course, women, like men, are also not all gendered in the same way. But within this diversity, clearly there must be a mutually accepted stance that despite cross-cultural di differences, there exist certain universal rights. We also can't make general assumptions about women and their experiences. 
we need to take into account the intersection of gender with other identity-based characteristics, such as race, caste, class, religion, sexuality, ethnicity, as a counterbalance to what we call essentializing women, making them all the same. It is here that we come to the vulnerable material body, a universal, since to be human means to have a vulnerable body. Is the female body, however, in some ways more vulnerable? After all, as my Mason colleague Deborah Bergoffin has worded it, it is a given that patriarchy has always marked the woman's body as definitively other and as uniquely vulnerable. So what I'm asking is whether or not the vulnerable female body can form a sort of bridge a way of seeing and understanding differently between the private, traditionally female, and public, traditionally male, spheres, and between violation and representation. Since, when you think about it, after the actual event, all we have left is the representation, not as a replica of past outrage, but as a purposeful disturbance of the real. So what kind of representation? Fiction has its own set of issues that are not applicable to the truth claims of factual representation. Fiction does make some factual uh, truth claims, but always filtered through distance, <coughs> space, memory, and language. Published narratives can unsettle our conceptions of both personal and national identity, dismantle the foundational fictions through which nations can um, reconstruct their histories, and open up new debates. But no one individual story can stand as the ultimate truth. Arthur Frank tells us that stories always pose the question of what kind of truth is being told. But stories never resolve that question. Their work is to remind us that we have to live with complicated truths. Let me list some of these complicated truths by asking some questions to which there are no simple answers. Is there a difference between literarily constructed text and the constructed stories that find their way into memoirs and testimonies? between texts authored by women rather, uh, rather than by men about women or about men? Is there an advantage to reading about the artistic outrages of human rights violations as opposed to a strictly historical account and to other representations of expressions of violence in, uh, against women in news and police reports and in documents that have been produced by human rights organizations? Is there a difference between representations of human rights violations against women and girls as a result of war and genocide, political regimes, or state-sponsored terrorism. Think conflict stations, rape camps, prisons. Think Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Argentina, and unfortunately countless other nations. And as a result of culturally sanctioned societal, historical, and religious practices that dehumanize women and girls. And the list is long. Think female genital cutting, female infanticide, sati, which is widow burning, honor killings, acid burning, daughter selling, forced marriages, dowry killing, foot binding, virginity testing, modern day slavery, stoning, sex trafficking, sex tourism. Does giving or reporting an account of gendered human rights violations differ from telling a story, both potentially using Western perspectives to understand victimization? witnessing, remembering, and recovery as a framework without fully understanding that other cultures may see things differently. Some scholars believe that pain can bring an individual to a state that is pre-linguistic. The painful violation has the capacity to destroy all language and meaning. Others insist that there is strength, defiance, and resistance, even in silence. To be vulnerable is not the same as to be a victim. Even the act of witnessing itself is complex. Eyewitness testimony based on firsthand knowledge and bearing witness to something that can't be seen. Is one form more true than the other? To my mind, obviously, there is a clear need to recount and listen to stories in order to understand the world better and to deepen our understanding of what is morally wrong. Stories allow us to create a space for collective self-examination and self-reflection. In the language of poetry and stories, as Augustine Manguel has put it, there are no labels, no borders, no penalty. Instead, there are interpretations, open endings, open endings, sorry, and layers of truth. 
connection of truth brings us to the issue of credibility and authenticity. Who establishes the criteria for credibility? Who even gets to decide whose story may be told? In other words, who gets to speak and for whom? It is sometimes the case, as some of my students will remember uh, who are here, it is sometimes the case that the narration of human rights violations needs to be told to the physical and spiritual body when actually naming is much too, much too powerful and frightening to use, as, for example, in Nora Oakdale's novel, Comfort Woman. Critics have questioned whether the female I, capital I, truly speaks on behalf of herself, as well as on behalf of the we of all violated women in a particular setting, as, for example, the narrator of Alice Walker's Possessing the Secret of Joy, a female genital fetish. Mendy Mouse's memoir, Slave, Suad's memoir, Burned Alive, or the voices in the film, The Stoning of Soraya M. Is shame removed or reduced when one group of women speaks out, encouraging another group to tell their story? Everyone has the human right to tell his or her story, and it is the right of human writers and artists to narrate, to speak for themselves and for others, recalling specific violations of the past, interpreting and adding creatively to their past, and it's our responsibility, two words, Kelly Oliver's turn to bear witness and to react. So let me return to the underlying questions. Can we and should we bring a gender perspective by paying attention to the female body in the representation of human rights violations, and if so, why and how? It is possible that women's stories can connect more powerfully to commonalities of women's status and global subordination asking us as readers to commit to some kind of action. But, ironically, it is often the case that these realities need to be fictionalized before they can even be understood. This last idea brings me to short examples that I hope will illustrate what I mean by the differences among alternative forms of narrative and how, as readers, we react to them. I've chosen three narratives the first one from an excellent piece of investigative reporting, the second from a best-selling memoir of Cambodia, and the third from the beautiful poetic novel of Nepal in India. My students learn the statistics in the first text, always react viscerally to the description in the second, and inevitably talk endlessly, interpreting the mind of a 13-year-old girl, a prisoner in a brothel in the third. Quote, there were 28 million slaves in the world at the end of 2006. Approximately 1.2 million of these 28.4 million slaves are young women and children who were deceived, abducted, seduced, or sold by families to be prostitutes across the globe. The total annual number of individuals trafficked for commercial sexual exploitation is between 500,000 and 600,000 out of the total number of annual human trafficking victims of 1.5 to 1.8 million. One woman or child is trafficked for the purpose of sex exploitation every 60 seconds. And that's from this, a marvelous book, Siddhartha Kari's Sex Trafficking Inside the Business of Modern Slavery. Quote, the clients were horrible. To them, we were meat. They would say, I paid a fortune, and you're not even pretty, and smack, hit you against the wall. Some of them liked the women and did it for sport. They were dirty and stank. In my memory, their dirtiness is the most repugnant thing, that and the smell. But one night, Lee dumped a bucket of live maggots on me, hideous maggots, like the ones on me. When he realized how much they frightened me, he began dumping them into my mouth and on my body while I was sleeping. I thought that they would make their way inside me, into my body. That's what I have nightmares about, even now, from the now celebrated Romal Imam's memoir, The Road of Lost Women. What you do. Before it starts, you hear a zipper bearing its feet. Perhaps the sound of a shoe being kicked aside in haste the wincing of madness. Once it starts, you may hear the sound of hands bleeding in the street below. The peanut vendor hawking his treat. The pop of a rubber ball as the children shout and play. 
in the schoolyard nearby. But if you are lucky, or if you work hard at it, you hear nothing. Nothing, perhaps, but the clicking of the fan overhead, the steady ticking away of seconds until it is over, until it stops again. From Patricia McCormick's novel, Close. Let me end with some comments from over 75 Georg Mason students who have taken my classes on narratives and human rights. Uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, gender and human rights, and who do truly believe, <coughs> amusingly, that the muse followed my courses. I hope that they demonstrate how women's stories of human rights violations can deeply teach and affect individuals for the rest of their lives. I have taken what I've learned outside of the classroom, and I have sparked discussions about human rights violations against women and girls with some of my friends, and even my coworkers. It is unbelievable how many people out there have no clue these atrocities are occurring today. The narratives make the reader almost feel the experience. I can no longer remain silent. College is the discussion of these materials. It is vital. If not here, then where? I now have a feeling of hope in that maybe one person can change the world because every movement starts with one person saying, I want to help or I want to change. These texts encourage activism and awareness, and college students need to know what's happening in our world. I feel powerful by knowing and understanding more about this, and in a sense of being part of this fight for equality, equity, and respect. Saving the world starts with learning. Next, Mindy.